Hi, Jamie, and welcome to the Mary Jess Meets podcast. How are you doing? Hi, Mary Jess. <laughs> Very well indeed, thanks. I'm delighted to be talking to you today. I'm delighted to be talking to you as well. I tell you what, I never thought I'd start a podcast, but I'm really enjoying it. It just gives me an extra opportunity to spend an hour chatting with my friends. <laughs> yeah, quite. And I think this is something you'll be incredibly good at, Mary Jess. Well, I love and very your innovative of you. <laughs> Thanks. I always try to come up with ideas, but I've got to say this was actually Rich's idea. He said, oh, why don't you start a podcast? Because he loves listening to them. And it's always something that I thought, oh, it's just another thing to do, isn't it? And there's so many things that you could be doing. There's a lot of things that I feel like we're being pressured to do right now as musicians as well. I get lots of emails in my inbox at the moment from various mailing lists that I've signed up to going, you should be doing this during this coronavirus time and you should be doing this, that and the other and X, Y, Z. And this is one of yeah. the things I didn't think I'd end up doing. But <laughs> And I think that there is, there is interest in, in you know, what makes a singer write a song. What, what do they feel when they're singing it? And... Um, it, it, it all helps paint a picture. Absolutely. And it's a picture that you don't get to paint when you're on a, a radio interview, for example, because you only get two minutes. You've got to stick everything that you want to say or you need to say into that two minute block. And it, it's a lot of pressure really, isn't it? Whereas this is a lot more, we can relax a bit more here. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it gives us time to get to know you, Jamie, which is what I'm really excited about because... I think for singers, a lot of people see our singing brand on social media and all those kinds of things nowadays. Um, and they don't actually doubt, get to delve into who you are as a person. And that's often where the most interesting stories come out. So I think it's really great that we get to have this more long form conversation where I could maybe talk to you about how you got into music or your days in the Navy or, you know, anything like that. That would be really interesting. And yeah. uh, things that I want to hear more about myself, really. <laughs> ah, yeah. So I guess well, we I... could start, um, start from the very beginning. Very good place to start. <laughs> could talk about how you got into music, because I know you were um, in quite an amazing musical family, weren't you, Jamie? Well, uh, I don't think we were so much musical as creative. And so for me, I was almost born... I'm not sure that you know this, okay. in, a, in a recording studio. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was the Chapel Recording Studio in Bond Street. Oh, my god! Where my mother did a lot of her recordings. And she was not a musician, but she was a creative. So she started life as the youngest theatre producer, age 20, wow. in Blackpool. That's amazing. And then... And then she was spotted and she had such creative ideas uh, with people like Frankie Howard, who were at the start of their careers. And um, she joined the 1950s. She got the musical rights to Beatrix Potter, all the Beatrix Potter stories. That's and so I haven't quite found out which one she was recording on the 23rd of October. October. God, do I dare say my year of birth? I'm going to. 19, 1958. Very nice. <laughs> and, and she was recording, I think, The Tales of Peter Rabbit. I like to think it was that one because that was my favorite. And she got amazing people to come. She got David Croft uh, to write the lyrics to the songs. Wow. And Cyril Ornadel, her, her business partner, who was the lead conductor in the 1950s, he would do the Royal Variety Show and things like that. And David Croft was a young man. And uh, just at the start of his career, of course, he then went on to write one or two shows that we've heard of. <laughs> Dad's Army. No way, Can you imagine? He wrote Dad's Army. Um, That's incredible. Are you being served? No. Oh my God, allo, allo. Oh my God, uh, so, allo, allo. <laughs> and, and he did much more besides. And uh, so she was very lucky to have this extraordinary talent on board. And she, she would invite um, famous actors to come 
and 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 read the stories, sing 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 the songs, and um, she put them out. She was the first person to use coloured vinyl, which had come over. They were using it in America. So you're too young, Mary Jess, to remember forty fives. These were little records, and each story was a different colour. And so they were green, they were yellow, and as a child in every nursery in Britain, there were the Beatrix Potter series. And my favorite was the tale of Peter Rabbit. And it was such a joy to take it out of its sleeve, put it on the record player and, uh, and listen to it. And she was so keen to finish the recording that day that her waters broke. And she still had to finish the recording because you and I know when you've got an orchestra there, you can't afford to not use them. So well, yeah, but she, where would your waters break, Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> she 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 did finish it. Jumped into a taxi. Practically had me in the taxi, and I was born down the road in 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 the London clinic. No so way. that was my my welcome to the world. Yeah. Wow. Um, I admire your mum's bravery trying to finish before giving birth. That's quite <laughs> that's quite yeah. amazing. But so for and somebody born into such creativity, Jamie, how did you then end up going into the navy? That seems like quite a big jump and a well, big Yeah. Well I, I guess um I, I guess I was I was really um it was like a tug of war. My mother and my father had started the World Record Club. And that, you know, they used to work 18 hour days. And even in my bedroom at home in Chelsea Square, my bedroom was on the ground floor and above was the drawing room. And it was used as the audition room. So I used to go to sleep at night time hearing these extraordinary sounds from above and it really made me i guess subconsciously think that it's perfectly normal to stand on a stage and perform and then i then i went to um i went to a musical i think it was peter pan uh say a pantomime with my rather smart neighbors and Unfortunately, they had a box. So I sat with them in their box and on stage they said, would any child like to come and help us sing this next song oh, on wow. stage? And I remember standing up, I was six years old, and I, I put my arms up and, and waved frantically. And I, I think I, I just remember this feeling, this is what I want to do. Wow. Amazing, yeah. at age six, to feel like that. Yeah, and then unfortunately, I, I, I went back to Kingston La where we lived, and I said to the vicar, I want to sing a solo. And he said, well, I'll tell you when the time's right. And there were only five people in church on Sundays. But the next Sunday was the Christmas carols service. Oh, so all 90 people in the, in the village turned up. That's quite different to five, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And of course, the embarrassing thing was that I knew all of them. And so when the vicar suddenly said, without warning, Jamie's now going to come up and sing a song. <laughs> what pressure! And, and, you know, I was horrified, but I went up and uh, I, I can remember um, uh, looking at my older sister, my 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 very dear sister Joanna, who was a year older, and she was in the front pew up against the wall. And you know how powerful older siblings can be. And as a joke, she got her fingers and put them into her ears and went like that, just as I was about to sing something. Oh, no. <laughs> and with that, I ran back and I hid in my mother's coat. And I couldn't sing a solo 
even when I was in choirs and they would say, Jamie, will you sing the solo? No, I would say, I'm happy to be head of choir, but please don't ask me to sing a solo. And for 32 years, I couldn't sing a solo. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's, that's it became my, Jamie. <laughs> it, it became my, my greatest fear. And I think the only point of mentioning it is everybody has a fear. And um, if they don't, they're extremely lucky. And I think, you know, what I've learned is it's so empowering to actually face your fear. How did you face that fear though? What gave you the idea that you then wanted to, if it's something you were so adverse to doing, what then gave you the idea that you wanted to go ahead and sing a solo somewhere? Well, that's a very good question, Mary Jess, because um, <laughs> my neighbour was a lovely lady called Betty Bleakley, and I'll always be very grateful to her. And she was a retired soprano, and she lived with Desmond Bleakley, who was a theatre organist back in the <laughs> days at a silent film. And he was like a pop star. He'd rise up. Uh, and... Uh, they would always be giving singing lessons. And one summer's day, the window was open. I could hear them teaching a soprano to sing. And I, I said, Betty, would you teach me to sing? And uh, she said, well, I'll have to audition you first. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> uh, I think, I I love she, this I think she... already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, luckily, she took, took me on. Uh, quite a challenge, I have to say. And, uh, and then... Um, uh, after a month, she said, Jamie, you've got to take part in my student concert. And I said, no, 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 no. I, I'm happy just coming for lessons. I will never, ever perform in front of anybody. And she said, Jamie, if I'm teaching you, you will have to take part once a month singing a solo in my student concerts around and about in Oxfordshire. Wow. Yeah, and that's what did it. And I was so terrified. I can remember my, my knees just literally physically banging together. <laughs> it was terrifying. And after three months of this, I suddenly realized, God, I'm beginning to enjoy this. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. So that was the beginning, really. I guess it makes such a difference when you've got somebody there who obviously believes in you and they want you to do this because they know that you're good and they know that you can. Well, I'm not sure they thought that. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, she put you on after auditioning you, so it sounds like she believed in you and wanted you to do it because she loved your voice. And that's wonderful. Having that kind of belief from somebody else must have made you feel more confident to go ahead with it, do you think? Well, it... It, it, it was, I think, the fact that I, I was not given the choice. And, <laughs> yeah. and so I had to face what was my greatest fear. And what I say to people now is write down a list of your greatest fears and think, how am I actually going to tackle each one of them? Because when you do, it's empowering. And you, you know, once, you, once you break through that fear barrier, you know, you then smash it and it's never there again. Wow. So, so thanks to Betty and Desmond. And I, I unfortunately, they're no longer with us. Uh, they lived to a great age. And um, in, in fact, lovely Betty asked, I was singing in Grange Park Opera at the time, and I suddenly got a call to say Betty had asked, for the vicar not to take her funeral, and would I take her funeral? That that is quite a responsibility. Oh my gosh! Um, and she always said, "Oh, you're like a son to me," and um, and we grew really very close. So I'm so grateful. And they they taught pupils who are now singing all over the world in their own way and how enriched our lives are as a result mm. of two people. That's completely wonderful. I love things like that, how they've really left 
so much of themselves behind by teaching their their knowledge and their passion to other people i think that's really wonderful and that's what i love about working with the young people that i work with is is that that feeling that you get and it's lovely when you get to see somebody flourish in a really nice way and the idea that they've left so many good things behind is is really lovely that they're able to then carry on with the inspiration and and doesn't it show what a difference that one person can make and betty made that difference that's wonderful but you said this was 30 years later so when did you start having lessons with betty well i went there um probably at about the age of 38. oh really so that was yeah yeah, and I, I suddenly felt the desire, um, I felt the desire, but I never realized it would lead on to actually songwriting. Um, and Betty said, oh, Jamie, um, you, you've left it too late to be a tenor. Um, if you had started when you were 18, your voice would have gone up. And so opera is out for you. Well, of course, I wasn't accepting of that. <laughs> I did. And so I, 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 I sneaked in a, a weekend opera course at Woodstock. And um, it was called Opera Festa, if I remember right, for the weekend. And at the end of the opera course, they gave me a song to sing. Well, I'd only sung it once in, in class. And they said, we want to sing you to sing it, a solo, um, in the concert on Sunday night. Oh, gosh. And uh, they just said, live dangerously. Well, I'm, I'm always somebody that actually likes to probably over-rehearse. This was the only time in my life I simply didn't know this song, and I was going to perform it. and. They luckily gave me a soprano who would die in my arms. And I just threw myself into the role. Wow. And it was so real. And after the concert, two people came up to me from the audience and they said, Jamie, uh, we love what you did. Would you be interested in auditioning for us opera anywhere because we're going to be putting on an opera called Gianni Schicchi by Puccini. Oh, I love Gianni Schicchi. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they said, would you do the role? Would you audition for the role of Gerardo? Well, I said to them, I've never auditioned in my life, but I'll certainly give it a, it'd be a good experience <laughs> to turn up. And I went and they said, God, we can't believe you haven't auditioned before. And uh, we'd like to offer you the role. Wonderful. So we, you know, three, three months of rehearsals, I loved it. I was hooked. And it was great fun to have this, albeit minor role, in a great fun opera um, about, about this old man who had died and left all his money to the convent. And they had heard a whisper of this, and they thought if they could hide the fact that he was dead, rewrite his will, pretending one of them, Johnny Skeeky, pretends to be hit, the old man in his bed to the lawyers, and leaves everything to Johnny Skeeky. <laughs> and then he says, my palaces, in Rome, I leave to Janiski Ki. And <laughs> you know, having previously agreed that he would split it equally between the various family members in the room, it's a hilarious opera. Mm -hmm. And I suggest it's a good one for people to see if, if they are not really very familiar. I think with opera, it's, it's, it's it's very important to see the right ones first that gets you to understanding it before you progress. Because a difficult opera can put anybody off. Mm. Yeah. And I, I always say, started. sorry, go on. And I, I, I always say, start with Tosca. And then secondly, La Traviata. 
both good choices. And I think I'd suggest to somebody that they go and see the one where they know the most songs because we tend to like what we're familiar with. So if they're hearing a song they've heard before, like O Mio Babino Car or Nessun Dorma, then they might feel more connected with that opera because they've heard those songs before. Yes, I remember my grandfather taking me as a treat when I finished, I think I'd finished, um, I'd, I'd just finished A-levels and he took me to Aida. Wow. And uh, Covent Garden. I, couldn't understand a word of it. There were no <laughs> surtitles or anything. And, um, uh, and it put me off opera for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny that you found your way back. I'm sure Betty would be so proud of you. I mean, look at what you're doing now when she's taught you <laughs> so much and now you're going on and singing all over the world. It's, it's absolutely amazing. I'm sure she'd be so proud. Well, I think the other message is never too late to start something. And, and, you know, here we are stuck with this coronavirus and who knows how long the lockdown will be. And, yeah. you know, certainly I, I had it and I was, I was in, in solitary confinement for two weeks. I can't it, believe you had it. You're the only person I know who's actually had it. And I just, as soon as you sent me a message, I was terrified for you. I then... <laughs> I think my uh, reply that came back was like full of exclamation marks going, oh no, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, well, I think in London, a lot of people luckily have had it very mildly. That is lovely. And, but and for me, I... it horrible. For me, I would liken it to probably a bad flu. Um, and I... I I was very obedient. You know, I just slept all day. I didn't watch films because it would keep me awake. So I tried to watch rather, rather dull programs on television that would just send me back. <laughs> and so I was probably sleeping for about 18 hours. And I, I think that is the best. You, you know, people must not try and work through it. If you, if you just give in and, and rest, I think that is the body's best medicine and not to breathe in cold air because that's that. that. So I'm back singing again. Good. And I'm so glad you I'm enjoying, so I'm enjoying you. everything that life has to offer. Wonderful. But it is, what my point was, it, it, it's a good time to reflect. And my thing is I left it incredibly late to start singing. And so I invite your listeners to to use this lock up time to reflect on what what else it'd like to get out of life and use this time where we're locked in our our our, our, our homes wisely yeah that's very good advice i mean a lot of people are dealing with this in lots of different ways um, I know some people are finding it easier to have a lot of pyjama days um, and eat their body weight in chocolate whilst watching a movie <laughs> to make themselves feel better. And then there's other people who are really on it, really trying to focus on things. Um, but when you've got a period of such uncertainty, sometimes it's difficult to get into that mindset, isn't it? It is. And I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm used to my Navy days where we would go to sea for three or four months and we'd be at sea for six weeks and um, you have to learn to basically keep entertained and so it was quite fun on board ship because i was the film officer and um that was one of my responsibilities and so i had to take you know a few tons of film on reel that i'd collect in Portsmouth and we would show it in about four different cinemas on board in in the in 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 the basically dining rooms on board and uh, so Wednesday and Saturday nights at sea would be film night and I learned you cannot please everybody uh, <laughs> But the thing that used to please everybody was the Tom and Jerry cartoon that we would always start start the evening off with. And Amazing. that was always fabulous. <laughs> I 
Please and I think the, the only time I basically got wonderful feedback from everyone on board, there were 250 men on board and um, was ABBA. The really? film ABBA, yeah. I would that, never have guessed. Yeah, the, the, the sailors had spent far too long at sea and really enjoyed ABBA. Yeah. <laughs> That's I forget I forget her name, but she was very much the pin up of the services. <laughs> it's funny though, because when you talk about the Navy, I think of um aircraft carriers like the Ark Royal, for example, because that's what my dad was on. Um but you were on quite a different ship, weren't you, with the Navy, didn't you? Well, I I, I was I was very lucky because I, I was only in the Navy for five years. And uh the first year was at, at Dartmouth. Uh, where we were, we we joined as midshipmen, where you're treated as the lowest of the low, <laughs> and uh, that was that that was great fun. Great um, character building, I imagine. Yeah, and then a year. Uh, my my parents, my grandparents, were very keen that I join the Grenadiers, the army, and I didn't realise they didn't quite forgive me for saying that I was not going to join the army. And my way of rebelling, although it was quite minor rebellion, looking back, but at the time it felt quite serious, was saying to them, I'm going to join the Navy. And they came to, <laughs> they came to watch my passing out parade at, at Dartmouth. And when we, the last thing we did, the Queen was taking the parade, we had to march up the steps all the way up and when we hit the top step we were passed out as commissioned officers in 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 the royal navy wow and my grandfather slid up behind me without me realizing and he he just hit me in the small of the back and i turned around and he said i forgive you and of course i thought he was joking <laughs> Then I realised he, he wasn't at all, and it took him to recognise that the navy could also march. And once he realised the navy could march, suddenly it was all right that his grandson had not joined <laughs> the Grenadiers. That's so funny! It's funny that it's marching that made him feel all right with it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's absolutely. It's also funny that they couldn't forgive you. I mean, it's your life. It's your decision yes. what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I think for him, he had wanted to make a career of the army. But in those days, if you had a slip disc, that was it. You were out of the army. So he, he yearned, I think, for me to, to, to basically go on and do what he had not been given a chance to do. I guess he saw what could potentially be a great life for him that he couldn't have. So I guess he just wanted that great life that he thought he could have for you. And that's yeah. really lovely, isn't it? And I think we have to be careful. Um, you know, I, I have fathered five children and we must never put too much pressure on pushing them in any one particular direction. I just try and encourage them to find their passion because if it's their passion it will not be work and they will then not count the hours not count the energy not count the cost and invariably you're then successful at it and you're then happy so that's that 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 that's my thing which i really learned from them pushing me into the grind can i tell you a secret oh go on then I mean, because no one will hear. <laughs> you know why I didn't want to join the Grenadiers? Why is that, Jamie? I was quite a softie at school. You are. Right. Didn't, didn't particularly like rugby because I was always, as a pianist, terrified that I was going to break a finger. But I really didn't fancy sleeping in trenches. <laughs> and the thought of my own cabin on board a warship, that, that won it. Every I mean, time. That's completely fair enough. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that's completely fair enough and completely understandable. But while you were in that small cabin, I'm wondering if you can pass on a bit of advice how to keep yourself entertained, you say. So the Navy really taught you how to keep yourself entertained for yeah. a long period of time when you couldn't go out and do other things. So have you got any advice? <laughs> well, uh, you know, as I, I was fortunate, I, after my year at Dartmouth, I spent a year in the Dartmouth training squadron. So that was an aircraft carrier, HMS Bulwark, Amazing. a destroyer HMS Fife. And we went um, the hurricane relief ship, Hurricane David in the Caribbean, which destroyed the island of Dominica. So we, we had the government come on board and run the island from our operations room wow. on board the destroyer with our helicopter doing all the um, casualty evacuation oh and God. flying supplies. And that introduced me to the Caribbean, actually. And I've loved it ever since. Um, a year and a half in Northern Ireland, uh, keeping the peace. And that was very interesting, very hard work. And then my final year was in Britannia the Royal Yacht. Oh, wow. And I have to say, she's probably the most beautiful ship in the world. I went round her the other day. She's, she's, I think, the main tourist attraction next to Edinburgh Castle in Scotland. Wow. And she sits in Leith, so you can stay in Edinburgh, and it's a 10-minute taxi ride. And you, you can just spend an hour or two hours going round, and it's in it's exactly as it was. She's beautifully maintained and going back, brought back fabulous memories. I'm sure it did. What an amazing honor to be stationed on the Royal Yacht. That's absolutely incredible. What were your roles that you had to do on there? Well, I was very fortunate because I, my, my responsibility, I was in charge of the Royal Barge. And so uh, it, what it meant was that wherever we went in the world, we would anchor off and there would only be one boat that went to the island. And that was, that, that, that was effectively the Royal Barge. And my responsibility was the timely and safe arrival of of, of the barge and of course a lot of these islands that we went to in the Commonwealth in the in the South Pacific they had not been charted since Captain Cook no way charted their depth and coral can grow I forget but it can grow at something like one or two inches a year right so in the a hundred and thirty years had passed since it was charted. Oh my gosh! Um, you know, anything could happen. Well, it's a completely and different landscape, surely. The navy spent big money on Polaroid glasses, so that ultimately I could see where the shallow, the, the shallow coral was, and avoid it. Oh wow! Um, because with the BBC cameras on the jetty waiting for our arrival. Um, it would not have done for Sub Lieutenant Lonsdale <laughs> to drive the Royal Bar to ground. Oh my gosh, well, I'm sure it would have made great television, but not exactly the kind of. <laughs> <you wanna. laughs> no, no. Um, but fortunately, you, you never worry too much as a 24 year old. Uh, you just get on and do the job, and, and three of us junior officers would drive the yacht around the world and keeping to the navigation officer's line. And we would, we would avoid shipping and uh, avoid storm clouds if we possibly could. Um, it was a great experience. But now the thought of that responsibility uh, is enough to give me nightmares. <laughs> but it, it's interesting, at 24, you just say, yes, sir, and you get on with it. Wow. Um, yeah. That is a lot of but, responsibility though, but it, it sounds like you really enjoyed it. So what made you decide to leave after that year? You said your last year was there. Well, um, 
I think it was the fact that it was such a beautiful experience to go around the world doing what we did. Um, I was conscious that I ha had inherited um, a farm in Oxfordshire and it was very run down and it was being sold off piece by piece every year. Oh, right. And I thought, well, actually, I can either spend my another three years or a full career in the Navy, or I can come out and spend these three years doing a, a um, diploma in rural estate management. And I thought, actually, that will leave me with far more useful knowledge than my navigation skills. Do you really? So I, that's that's yeah. such a huge change though. I mean, you've got to be so brave to make a de decision like that when it's just the complete opposite. Well, it's completely yeah. different to what you've done before. And I, I was loving the Navy. I was absolutely loving it. So it was quite, it was quite a hard thing. But you asked me an interesting question. How did we entertain ourselves? You've got to be creative, I think, when you're in lockdown, as we all are. Mm. Um, how to ent entertain and so we did it by i mentioned the two full nights each week um and then twice a week we would have the quiz competition and uh 20 questions and so i had to spend all my holiday time going around wh smith because there was no google in those days <laughs> finding every, every quiz book of questions. And I was the quiz officer, so I had the ship's radio, and it would go to all 250 on board. When the Royal Party on board, that was another 50 people. And we would also have an escort ship, which would be a frigate with maybe another 200 men on that and a tanker. So there'd be a great many people taking part in the quiz that oh, went wow. over the radio. And it managed and to, it went over the radio on the other ships as well. That's it. That's it. And uh, we used to have great fun. And of course, sometimes with, with um, as you know, taking part in a quiz, sometimes there's more than one answer. And ultimately, my decision was fine. But it, <laughs> it did end up being quite heated debate sometimes. <laughs> well, that's a good way to spend a few hours in a heated debate trying to figure something out, isn't it? <laughs> it's a good way of passing some kind of time. But, you know, you have to be inventive and would have sports, um, you know, sports days on the upper deck and uh, deck coits. Because, of course, you know, if, if you th threw something in the air, it was quite likely to go over the side. So using masking tape, we would create these deck coits and be able to play badminton. And if it went over the side, it was not the end of the world. <laughs> so it's about being inventive. And I think here with the coronavirus, we, we have to uh, slightly challenge ourselves and not become too addicted to television. Mm. I completely agree. And it's read really... all those books that we've meant to read for years to <laughs> write a short story. Yes. And that, that, that's fun because I think in all of us, we have creativity. I never knew that I would ever write a song. And, you know, that was such a, an accident. And I, I believe people should just exercise the creative part of their, their mind just by sitting down for 15 minutes each day and writing something, not for other people, but for themselves. And that might develop and lead into something really quite significant. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the main point, what you've said there is every day have that designated time, even if it's just 15 minutes to sit and try and write something. Cause I know a lot of people, they, they wait until they think creativity and inspiration is just going to give them a 
bonk on the head <laughs> and then suddenly they'll have something but yeah. it's actually a muscle that you train I don't think people realize that so if you've got that time every day where you're going to sit down you're going to be creative then you're allowing yourself that time even though sometimes things don't come to you that muscle will start to flex and then more often things will come to you so it's not something yes. where you're waiting for inspiration to strike like a lightning bolt. It doesn't work like that. I mean, sometimes it does, but very rarely. So you've got to be allowing yourself to have that time every day so that then something can come, even if sometimes it doesn't. You know, you're giving yourself the opportunity for it to appear at some point. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I never thought I could write a song. I, I didn't even plan to write a song. And then one day, about five years ago, I was shaving and uh, I suddenly felt a nice line that I wanted to sing. So I got my iPhone and I switched on the record button and I got to the end of the line and then another line came and with it, the lyrics. And after five minutes, I switched it off and I sent it to Robert Amory, the wonderful producer of, of our album, Footprints. And I said, Robert, whose song is this? And he listened to it and said, Jamie, it's your song. <laughs> and he said, when, when you've written 10, we'll do an album. And I said, Robert, You've got me totally wrong. <laughs> I'm a one song wonder. That's it. There's nothing else. I didn't know where it came from. And he said, well, I'll take a bet with you. So anyway, I'm now buying the drinks. <laughs> yeah, Robert, somehow he knows these things. He does. He's very clever. He very is. Clever, yeah. He, <laughs> he's so gifted. He is. Um, and he, he's such a good orchestrator as well. He's very good with people. Yeah. And it's lovely watching him work with an orchestra and with a choir and a temperamental soloist like me. <laughs> <laughs> the very professional soloist like you. <laughs> That's very kind of you. No, he's always blown me away. And it's his arrangements as well that really fascinate me that what he's done oh my gosh I can't even describe it you just it's something you've got to hear because I first heard his arrangements um when I was a special guest for Russell Watson for his UK tour because that's how I first met Robert he was Russell's MD um and his arrangements that he was using for the orchestra there were beautiful. Um, but then he's since done so many other things like Joanna Forrest's albums, for example. Which is so glorious, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, 100%. So Stars Are Rising and Rhythm of Life, her albums are, and they're so beautifully done. <laughs> his arrangements are stunning and they really showcase Joanna's voice um, in such a wonderful way as well. He's so mindful of what he's writing for. And uh, that's always blown me away. But uh, the orchestrations he's done for our songs, I just, you know, when you have that idea in your head of what a song should sound like, you know, when you kind yes. of hear, hear your song in your head and then you try and relay that to Robert as best you can. And then somehow it ends up sounding even more glorious than you imagined in your head. And you don't think what yeah. you're imagining in your head is even possible <laughs> for some of these things. So what he's done for our songs, like when we went up to write with him for Alleluia, for our song Alleluia. Um, we had a lot of the chords already because we'd written with John Butler, hadn't we? We'd written a chord Absolutely. on the piano. So we had a lot of that already and we knew that the, the lyrics were going to be Alleluia um, and we had a lot of the melody lines, but then it was a case of putting it together and, and trying to hear how the orchestra would fit around what we had. And I couldn't believe the speed in which Robert created our fully orchestrated song and then to hear it at Angel Studios being recorded, that just completely blew my mind. I just, I was in tears. <laughs> I was crying. Yeah. No, it was, it, who would have thought, Mary Jess, when, when you and I, you know, were discussing, because let's, let's, let's wind the clock back. You wrote one of the most beautiful duets I have ever come across. And uh, we've sung it now in a few concerts. Um, I Never Left You. 
but that's the only time I've ever performed it or sung it as well it hasn't been released so nobody else has heard it except for you and I and the people who came well I wish I wish you would release it because <laughs> it and it's it's so meaningful when we sing it and uh you know I'm not going to spoil it for people but it is absolutely beautiful and we'd sung it a few times so I said well Mary Jess seeing as you've written a duet how about if I write a duet for us to sing. And I never even imagined, I don't think I'd ever written a duet in my life. <laughs> and so it was quite a challenge. And, uh, and then we came up with Forever Together and about a dying father and a loving daughter. And, and I, I always wondered whether that would actually catch people's hearts. And I think when we last did it, um, it was at the other palace uh, theatre. Yeah, I think in, you're right. In, in Victoria. Mm. And somebody came up to me in the interval and said, did you realise there was this elderly man in the front row crying his eyes out? when you and Mary Jess were singing, singing that song. Oh. And uh, the thing is, you, you know this, when the lights are on you, you can't see the audience. So I had absolutely no idea whether it was having any effect whatsoever. And that ha has really encouraged me. Mm. That's amazing. I kind of want to find that guy and apologise to him, though. <laughs> Sorry, we made you cry. Bless him. That's so lovely. Yeah, well, I, I, think, I think it's nice when people come in to, to a, a, a theatre. They've, they've had a long day. They've had a tough day. They bring all the stuff of the world in with them. And I think what you and I do is is we, we take people on a journey for, you know, just over an hour, and we take them on a journey of, of joy, of sadness, of laughter. And so that when people leave, it's just lovely seeing, okay, it's probably helped by a few gin and tonics, um, <laughs> but they're leaving with a great big, smile on their face and much happier much happier for their their evening we've distracted them mm. from 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 whatever their anxieties are in in, in life and i think that's a, a great responsibility that we have mm. yeah absolutely i've got a lot of people contacting me at the moment saying during this really difficult time that they are turning to music more than ever before to try and make some sense out of their emotions and how they're feeling because it's a very difficult thing to react to emotionally what's going on because it's just so uncertain um, and there's so many scary news stories about the coronavirus that are coming out and I think that's really nice that people are able to take solace in music in some way because I know a lot of people when they're going through a difficult time they do turn to music. Absolutely. And um, it's quite a challenging time to, to be launching an album. <laughs> that is quite possibly one of the biggest understatements I've heard <laughs> for a long time. Because <laughs> I've, like, I've been putting on social media and emailing my email list going, you know, this is really great news. Even though the coronavirus is ruining everything, we're still going ahead with the Footprints album launch. But... Oh my gosh, how difficult. I just couldn't imagine how it's just, uh, well, I'll let you tell the story really because it's your album, but <laughs> there's so many ways in which the coronavirus is putting more hurdles in the way and it's already such a big job when you're an independent artist working on releasing your own album and it's in the classical charts. I mean, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a lot to focus on. I mean, how can you even do it when everything's going on in the world like this, when things aren't functioning at all right now? Yeah, well, certainly 
you know, it's it's a challenge. And, um, you know, I think that um, we, we've had we've had a lot of issues. I think Amazon have decided not to, at the last moment, to, to store CDs. And so we've had had to find a, a third party supplier. That's so um, difficult because I know a lot of people, they trust Amazon as, as the place to get things like that. I mean, I do, I order CDs from Amazon myself. I like having the physical CD. And the fact that it says not stocked when you're trying to release an album that's chart eligible is <laughs> that's really yeah. cool. Well, I'm glad we've now found we've found a third party who are now Great. listed on Amazon. So they will actually send out the CD on Amazon's behalf. Oh, and in a way, that. Amazon have, have much more important things to stock suddenly. Um, so well, that's they are, true, but it's, it still doesn't help your nerves during this. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, and a, a friend of mine very, very kindly gave me London's second biggest billboard for a week. A whole and week. A whole week. I, and it's called the a billboard. Yes. Well, it, hang on a minute. The the big massive with the pictures. That's <laughs> is, it. Is this the that's people who bought your house, Jamie, who have given you this? Is that through them? It it, it is. So and it, it's a wonderful company called JC Decor. And uh he 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 very kindly gave gave me He's, he said uh, that he wanted to give it to me for whenever I next had an event. And wow. so, so this was the week that, that and it's, it's, it's a huge, it's a beautiful board called the Kensington. Right. And it was designed by the Iranian architect shortly before she died. It was the last work that she created. And it's a beautiful shape. And it's, it's, it's basically on the Cromwell Road, quite close to the Tesco Superstore. And, um, and I imagine it in a normal week, millions <laughs> of people see it. Um, but of course, with the coronavirus, it's now up there since Friday. And I don't think <laughs> anyone, anyone is, is there. I was just uh, about to say, is it visible from Tesco? Because it's only going to be people getting their shopping that are going to be able to see it now. <laughs> And and I, I I thought well I must go and see it for myself so I I walked there I walked there yesterday and uh, and and realised that actually the people uh, from Tesco can't see it <laughs> I'm not quite sure who no! I'm not quite sure who can but it's 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 um it's a beautiful board and it's such an opportunity. And of course, normally you share the board with five other companies who are advertising the same week. And so every 15 seconds, it changes over to, to somebody else. Well, because of the coronavirus, they've all cancelled. Oh, yeah. And I felt very sorry for the neighbours who have to look at this board because all they've got this week I'm afraid it's my ugly mug. <laughs> well, at least somebody's able to see it, Jamie. Have you got a picture? Because I want to see it. Oh, did you take a picture well, when you went out for your one bit of exercise that you're allowed? Did you take a yeah, picture? Yeah, I, I took a selfie. Oh, I'll yes. have to send it to you. Yes. <laughs> yep. I want to see that. Oh, so my God. It, it's full of challenges. And um, I, I know... I know that um, we, we, we took an advert on a radio station and of course they closed down their headquarters and all went to their various homes to right. broadcast from their homes okay. and somebody pressed the wrong button. So of course it wasn't sending out the adverts. Oh no! <laughs> So the um, one thing that people, the one bit of advertising that people could listen to because they're stuck at home, then wasn't playing your adverts. Quite, oh, Jamie. quite, <laughs> yeah. So well, oh, we might no. be, we might be in the Guinness Book of Records for the least number of <laughs> albums downloaded, but hey, 
<laughs> it's fun. Oh my gosh. It's fun. Oh my goodness me. That's just But amazing. do you know the, the remember that really fun day that your 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 great friend John Butler, who's a lovely man and, oh, and such him, a yeah. gifted musician. He is and you 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 said, you know, he 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 you would like to bring in to sort of help us jam and collaborate. Yeah. And it was such a good choice because we we just had two or three hours and I had never jammed before in my life. I'd written songs in my own bubble, but never dangerously with two other musicians. <laughs> and and it was extraordinary is we have to trust each other, don't we? Oh, in yeah. that situation. You know, you, you're making a fool of yourself on tape. Yes. And anything can happen. It can work or it can fail. And we came up with our song Alleluia. And my goodness, and I, I just noticed in the first in the first short time, we've had twenty thousand views or more on YouTube. That's incredible. That's absolutely amazing. And, and you're right, we just came up with Alleluia. It was one of the first things that, that came to us. Um, and I think what you said was really right about n not being afraid to make a fool of yourself. I think that's really important because we were recording the session on just on GarageBand on my laptop, weren't we? Just so that if something came to us, we had it recorded. Um, and you're with people that you haven't worked with before. So you haven't worked with John before. Um, but you've got to be brave that when an idea comes to you to just say what it is and let it out into the world because even if it sounds silly to you it might spark a brilliant idea with your co-writer they might go ah that reminds me of this and then you get a melody or a lyric or something that you yeah. could have thought of yourself but it's made even better by the fact that you've shared it so you yeah. have to not be afraid to share that funny idea that you might get <laughs> yeah well, do you know, I was never very good at maths at school, but I do remember there is something called cubes to the power of three. Oh, yeah. And, and, and what, I've, what I've learned from our experience is that when three people come together, it's not three times better. It's to the power of three. And that's interesting. I really because like that, yeah. You, you know, you really come out with colours and direction and melodies and harmonies that you could never dream up on your own. And Mary Jess, your beautiful voice, I mean, when, when you go up high, which you do with such ease, <laughs> and I remember Robert in the recording studio saying, Mary Jess, your, your great strength is that you can, you know, ad lib and, and go off into the stratosphere. Um, this, is, this is the moment where, where you should take a risk. And you did. And, you know, we had, we had the music in front of us, but you just left and went right up there. <laughs> and I think that's what makes Hallelujah. I think that's what the audience like. Well, I hope so. Uh, to be honest, it's quite self-indulgent. I, <laughs> I just, I love the high notes. For me, they're the fun notes. I just, they're so much fun. And then to be in the recording studio where you've got the opportunity to record all these different ideas that come to you at that time is wonderful because not only do you get to experiment with different melodic lines, but you get to experiment with different vocal qualities. And you can just try the ones that you think will work and then pick one afterwards so that you know that you're bringing the song to life in the way that it was meant to be brought to life. And I, I love that so much, that recording feeling of, let's try this. <laughs> See what yeah. It's but so isn't it fun. nice? It, it's so nice that we're true to our art in that we, 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 we sing what we feel. You know, we're not thinking, oh, what will be popular? It's just about 
how do we feel and and expressing ourselves yeah and hopefully that truth will come across Mm. that's just so important that's so important because when it comes to a real place in you you know that it can then connect with a real place in someone else if you're trying to be something you're not with anything creative just uh, people see through that now especially yeah. in the age of social media you know people see straight away if you're not being your real self they, absolutely we're tuned into I'm, that now and it's just yeah it's so important you, know, you see why people like Lewis Capaldi and Ed Sheeran and Adele have been so popular is because they've written from their heart and that is something that is so important when you're writing and I I always remember I did um I did a writing camp with UK Trade and Investment out in Nashville and one of the writers that I worked with just absolutely loves Dolly Parton she's a, an amazing amazing inspiration and she said if you want to write a hit make it hurt and that is such a brilliant thing to remember yeah. I mean I, wow. I always like what writing things that feel uplifting and feel inspiring but I feel like that that saying works even with that as well because it's coming from the heart if you really feel it yourself then it means that the listener in the audience will feel it like you do and that's what's yeah. most important I feel quite well I've just been reading this amazing book uh, by Cyril Ornadel. I don't know whether you can see it. Oh, okay. Um, and it, it's called Reach for the Moon. He died sadly a few years ago, but he was my mother's business partner. Oh, wow. Really? And, and he, he was conducting, I think in the 1960, they, they recorded 27 West End musicals. Um, wow. And in... And then 1961, they did 25 Shakespeare plays to music. And then 1962, Laurence Olivier, they had reading the Bible, all the famous stories. And he was doing it for two months. He said he's never worked so hard in, <laughs> in all his career. But I, I, I just reread what he said my mother um, uh, told him. And this was probably in about 19... 60 she said if someone wants anything badly enough they will obtain it all our failures spring from a division of mind all our successes from singleness of purpose we must love what we are doing when we imagine with love we create what we imagine and the creation has real and lasting value. So I think that's pretty amazing. Wow. I um, love that. Yeah. And that really encapsulates mother, what we were just saying. Yeah. And she was so creative. And, and so I think I take from that, we must love what we're doing. Mm. And when we imagine with love, we create what we imagine. So... So I think that's that's pretty good words to pass on. Mm, I completely agree. Wow, I really like that. I feel like that would look lovely in a frame, that little <laughs> saying, to remind you to focus on that thing that you love so that you can make it what you do. Yes. Yeah, and I do feel so lucky that I do get to sing. I mean, there's lots of other things that you've got to do as a singer to be a singer. <laughs> but I do feel so lucky when I get to be on a stage and just sing. Or when I'm in the recording studio and I get to try all those ideas and sing into the microphone. And I feel so lucky that that's my job. I'm so Absolutely. lucky. Absolutely. I, I can remember. I mean, you and I have sung in so many lovely places. And... Uh, I, I can remember um, when you had your wonderful concert in Clapham mm. and there were, you know, quite a few hundred people in the audience. And I think um, half of them were Chinese. Yes. And, and it was only probably about 20 minutes into your concert that you suddenly started speaking to them <laughs> in Chinese and they were so impressed. 
But isn't it lovely to have an audience? Um, and that for me is what uh, really does it for me. I love, I love the intimacy mm. of a, a small cabaret theatre and yeah. just being able to share with an audience. And, um, and, you know, one can only ask friends to come once or twice a year. So it's, it's exploring the opportunity of developing a wider audience, mm. which I hope that our album is going to do. I hope so as well. And I just, I can't wait for that time when I can step onto a stage again and have a live audience there when all of this craziness is hopefully blown over and hopefully soon, that when we get to go out and do what we feel like we were born to do again, that, that will be an amazing feeling. And I know you had um, a few ideas in place for the launch of Footprints, which obviously is now has to be postponed because of the coronavirus, but are you still hoping that we might be able to do a Footprints concert of some kind, do you think? Oh, I, I think so. And London's newest theatre is, the, is at Mountview, the musical theatre school. Oh, wow. They, oh, yes. They've, moved, they've just moved from North London a year ago to Peckham. Wow. And I'm not sure that they've announced it yet, but somebody very famous in the musical theatre world has given them their new theatre. Oh, so wow. it's it, it's state of the art. It's wonderful. It seats 199. Fantastic. People. That's a that's a so nice it, size audience. You get that intimacy, don't you? Yes. It's 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 enough people that there is a tremendous atmosphere, mm. but it's still intimate. And uh, they have very kindly um, said they want us to to have our launch party whenever it may be. It oh was my gosh, be, that's great news. That's so exciting. It was, <laughs> it, it was gonna be in May and uh sadly we had to had to postpone it. But they're very much talking about about the autumn and who knows we might do one or two nights there. <laughs> it's, I love performing with you Mary Jess because you are always you you are always so professional and in all the gosh we've done 20 concerts together you know you've never dropped a line you are always <laughs> there you know i've dropped a line but you always <laughs> you've always been absolutely brilliant and i, I love singing you. with you do you remember I that lovely concert well. do you remember that lovely concert we did in hong kong oh that was wonderful Yes, I do. With oh. Lyndall Dawson on piano, my goodness. Oh, fantastic. Yes, that was amazing. And that was in such a great space as well. You had nice high ceilings. So it felt like even though um, there wasn't a microphone or a, um, a PA system or anything, you felt like your voice could travel very nicely. Um, and that felt like a very um, intimate concert as well, even though there were quite a lot of people there. I guess because you didn't have the electrical equipment that was hiding any of the natural qualities of the voice. I, I do enjoy concerts like that. I, I, I do as well. And it was all marble. And so the acoustic was very, very active. Mm. And uh, I remember um, singing I Need You, one of my solos, one of my si singles. Mm. Um, I think really for the first time there. And it was just before the interval. And a lady and her husband came up and she was in tears. And she said that had made the evening for her. Aww. And, you know, it's, it's those little moments in life that mean the most. Mm. And we've remained great friends, she and her husband, and I met her children and they come to London once a year. We all go out for uh a meal um it's lovely the experiences that come with singing mm, absolutely i really hope that we get to share the new music from footprint soon and have more of those 
experiences and those feelings very soon as well when all of this hopefully blows over so I'll look forward to that very much Jamie and I'm really looking forward to now with it being the release week everybody hearing our new songs for the first time and then hopefully they'll love to come and hear us sing them live that would be the most exciting thing wouldn't it <laughs> it would it would yeah well Jamie thank you so much for joining me on my Mary Just Meets podcast I'm just so happy oh my pleasure join me and chat just it's just I, I feel as if I could talk to you for hours I feel the same way <laughs> it helps when you've got a very interesting guest Jamie I feel like I could talk to you because you've got so many great stories so thank you so much for sharing them with us and I will hopefully get to speak to you again soon and sing with you again very soon I hope as well so do I okay that sounds good <laughs> I'll have to make sure I put, we've been talking about the album quite a bit, so I'll have to make sure I put the links down below in the description for anybody who's interested uh, in the songs. And uh, yeah. hopefully they can come and hear us sing them live. Well, hopefully they will enjoy Footprints. I hope so. I really hope and, so. And your wonderful voice <laughs> and, and um, Saski in Barbados, some Caribbean um, music, coming in there. Yeah, her voice um, is wonderful. Miranda Heltz, a great opera singer who sings at the Ritz um, on a regular basis. And uh, she and I sing Agnus Day, so that's a little bit of religion. It's a beautiful song, sung beautifully, I must say as well. It's a really lovely arrangement that you've done. And, and, and also the, the Chivna um, Military Ladies Choir which they just released a film about. And oh, have they? The, yeah, they sing a song with me called Circles. You wrote that and, with John, didn't you? John Butler and, again. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's right. And uh, they sing quite beautifully. And in fact, we made a music video, which we just released yesterday. So that, that, that's all fun. And oh, that's, that's all fantastic. on the album. Oh, wonderful. And a bit of jazz. Of course. <laughs> something for everyone absolutely yeah something to indulge every bit of music that you like as well Jamie I think that's important if you can tell it's coming from your heart and that you enjoy these things when you've got an eclectic mix on there can't you yeah well hopefully yeah. it's all fun absolutely well thank you so much again for joining me Jamie and I'll um, speak to you again soon I hope and I'll look forward to singing our songs live on stage hopefully in the near future as well thanks so much Mary Jess <laughs> thanks Jamie take Bye. care Bye.